In today's video, I went to a town built on top of a waterfall in western Hunan province. It is in the autonomous prefecture of Tujia people, a minority ethnic group in China. In history, it was ruled by chieftains for 800 years. The story is an epitome of China's ruling of ethnic minority regions in southwest China via the Tutsi system in history. In today's video, I'll tell you about the Tutsi system. Hello, I'm Yan Yan. Today, I'm in a town built above a waterfall in Hunan province. In history, this place used to be the territory of a Tutsi. Even today, there is still a palace of Tutsi in the town. The majority population of the town is Tujia people, an ethnic group in China. And today, I'll take you to explore this town. The town is located at the confluence of a small stream and the Yo River. Houses are built along the stream, a typical residing pattern in southwest China, just as we saw in Xijiang Miao village and Zhao Xing Dong village. But right at the place before the stream converges into the Yo River, there is a fault formed millions of years ago due to crustal movement. The water in the stream falls down the fault and goes into the last section of the stream before the stream converges into the Yo River. That's why the town looks like being built above the waterfall. On the east side above the waterfall, there is a complex of wooden houses. That was the summer palace of Tusi. They are private houses now, so I only filmed from outside. What is a Tusi? Since the house of Tusi is called the palace, it seems like Tusi is a title equivalent to a king. That's true in some degree. Actually, the old name of this town was King's Village, and the king in the name referred to Tusi. Tusi is often translated as chieftains because they were tribal leaders in the first place. But not any tribal leader was the Tusi. For example, in Xijiang Miao village, we met the Gu Zhangtou, whose ancestors in history were also tribal leaders of the 18 Miao villages, but they were not Tusi. The difference between a regular tribal leader and the Tusi is that Tusi was recognized as imperial officials by the central government. And that's the case for the Peng clan that ruled this region for eight centuries. The first leader of the Peng clan started out as a tribal leader and won the autonomy after a war. A copper column recorded this history. In early 10th century, during the chaotic years after the collapse of the Tang Dynasty, the Peng clan unified the various non-Han Chinese tribes in the mountains in northwest Hunan province. In expanding territories, it collided with the kingdom that ruled over Hunan province during that time. In August of 939, a war broke out. 
The violent war lasted for a year and ended with a peace agreement between the two sides. The sculptures behind me depict the scene of the two sides reaching peace agreement. The Peng clan was officially granted the autonomy by the king of that local kingdom. They recorded the agreement on a copper column. Now the copper column is stored in a small museum in the town. Ever since, during the 800 years between the 10th century to the 18th century, the Peng clan was the actual ruler of this land. Unable to rule the remote mountainous area with non-Han Chinese population, the ensuing dynasties continued to grant the Peng clan autonomy. In the late 13th century, the Mongol-led Yuan dynasty officially established the Tusi system. A century later, the Ming dynasty further optimized the system. Besides granting autonomy, the Tusi system clarified responsibilities. 1. Because the domains of Tusi were mostly located near the borders, Tusi were expected to maintain order and defend the border zones for the central government. 2. They were allowed to maintain private armies, but when the central government needed any reinforcement in a battle, Tusi were required to lead their private armies and join the central government in the battle. And that's what the Tusi of the Peng clan did. During the Ming Dynasty, the southeast coast of China were frequently raided by pirates. In the year 1556, at the age of 20, the young Tusi of the Peng clan led an army of 5,000 to a victory against pirates and was awarded first-class merit by the emperor. It was an honorable moment for the Peng clan. Tusi were not required to pay tax, but were required to present himself before the emperor annually and pay tributes to the central government in the form of local products. In return, the central government would award Tusi with large amount of gold and silver. In Beijing, there was even a place in the imperial city for training Tusi the ethic of meeting the emperor and paying tribute in case those Tusi were not familiar with it. The pavilion behind me is called Protocol Rehearsing Pavilion. When Tusi and the kings of vassal states came to Beijing to pay tribute for the first time, they would be taken here to practice the protocols and ethics of meeting the emperor. When the Ming Dynasty shifted the capital from Nanjing to Beijing, the Peng clan gave large amount of precious timber to the central government. In Beijing, the timbers were used to construct the new palace. If you visit the Forbidden City in Beijing, pay attention to the wooden columns in the palace. Many of them were given as tributes by the Peng clan. The responsibilities imposed on Tusi reinforced the idea that Tusi's domain was an autonomous region within China, not an independent kingdom. In the 12th century, feeling too close to central government road territory, the Peng clan moved their capital to more remote mountainous area. The king's village, however, remained to be the location of summer palace. There is a bridge above the stream, and it was said that Tusi loved to spend some time in this bridge. This bridge is leading to the palace of Tusi. It was said that Tusi always hang out in this bridge. Therefore, it was named the, the Bridge of Tusi. This kind of roofed bridge is common in ethnic minority inhabited regions in southwest China. We've seen similar ones in the Miao village and Dong village. But there is a unique thing in this bridge of Tujia people. At the end of each beam, there is a wooden pumpkin. Local people told me that Tujia people believe pumpkin is a symbol of fortune because the color of pumpkin is gold. They also believe the seeds in pumpkins would bring them lots of offsprings. This kind of design is in every Tujia architecture in the town. 
In the museum where the copper column is stored, there is an exhibition about Tudia people. These are their traditional dress, similar to those of Miao and Dong people. This is the bed of Tujia people. Usually it has multiple layers of canopies. Crying is a ritual on Tujia weddings. Days before the weddings, the bride should start crying about sadness of leaving parents. The crying lasts until the day of the wedding. At the entrance of the town, there is a big square. This is like the reed pipe arena in the Miao village and the drum tower in the Dong village. This is like the stage. It's called the Bai Shou Tang. Actually, in every Tujia village, there is a Bai Shou Tang. It's a place for people to gather and have ceremonial activities. Ethnic minority people tend to have more traditional rituals and worship activities. This is the typical Tujia house, the wooden structure, the pumpkin. Tujia people are believed to be the descendant of State Ba, which was conquered by State Qing more than 2,000 years ago. And after their state was conquered, they fled to the mountain in this area and uh, they also mingled with other people who fled to this area, including the Han people, and those people became the Tujia people. This is where State Ba was. After their country was occupied, people of State Ba fled to the adjacent Wulin Mountain to avoid being massacred. This region is where Tujia people are distributed now. But that's not the single source of Tujia people. For example, the Peng clan were Han Chinese from Jiangxi province, my home province. During the chaotic years in the late Tang Dynasty, they moved to the adjacent Hunan province and unified the tribes in the mountains. They adopted traditions of local tribes over the years and speak their language. Now the descendants of Peng clan living in this region are categorized into Tujia people. So Tujia people is not a concept about the same ancestor. It's rather a social group in Wulin Mountain who over a thousand years developed the same language and tradition. Due to their long history of interaction with Han Chinese, Tujia people have been influenced by Han Chinese culture. Their heritage has largely disappeared, including their dress, their language, and the crime ritual on weddings. That's why this town doesn't have that exotic feeling as the Miao village and Dong village gave us. Here, except for houses with certain Tujia features, nothing really reminds me that it's an ethnic minority inhabited town. Since the Ming Dynasty, the central government started replacing Tu Si with state-appointed officials. Of course, it didn't go smoothly, but this process was not reversible. In the year 1727, realizing not able to confront with the central government, the last Tu Si of the Peng clan requested to give up his title and domain and return to his ancestral home in Jiangxi province. That marked the end of Peng clan's ruling of this region for 8 centuries and 35 generations. After this land was fully annexed into the central bureaucratic system, it attracted many immigrants from other parts of Hunan province because although the town is in the mountainous region, the Yo River made it easy to access and naturally suit for commerce. The town is here, by the side of Yo River. Products like timber and tong oil could be shipped here from the mountains via the Yo River. And merchant fleet could go from the town all the way to the Yangtze River and from Yangtze River to major ports in China. That's how the large timbers were shipped to Beijing 600 years ago.
Up in the waterfall on the west side behind the houses you see here, there is a road paved with stone slabs. Since the 18th century, many businessmen moved here, engaging in the trading of tone oil produced in this region. They also opened up shops selling products they shipped back from other regions of China. The end of the road is the dock by the Yo River. During its most prosperous time, there were 200 shops along both sides of this road. In 1987, a movie filmed in this town became a blockbuster in China. In the movie, this town had a romantic name, Hibiscus Town. Because of the movie, the town became a popular destination for tourists. Visitors came here to look for scenes in the movie. In 2007, in order to promote tourism, local government changed the name of the town from King's Village to Hibiscus Town. Now, when Hibiscus Town is mentioned, few people associate it with Tusi anymore. In my next video of this series, I went to a fortress in northern Guizhou province. On top of the mountain was the palace of a powerful Tusi in history. In the year 1600, the conflicts between the Tusi and the Ming court reached the tipping point and the fierce battle between the two happened in this fortress. The battle ended the clan's ruling of the region for eight centuries and also dragged the Ming dynasty to collapse. I'm Yan Yan. I make videos about sites of interest in China and histories and stories behind them. Subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time.